Beautiful 2 is one of those gems that somehow keeps on giving almost 20 years after its release. And it's owed to the amazing work of the modders of course, who to this day finds new ways to innovate and bring this game to life. I've been playing mods like Stainless Steel ever since like 2008, but this year, 15 years later, I discovered the Stainless Steel Historical Immersion Project, from here on out referred to as HIP, a mod that takes Stainless Steel's excellent foundations and makes it a hardcore, historical and addicting experience that, and I'm not kidding here, completely reinvigorated my love for this game, and I'm so excited to share why with you right now. Make sure to sub to the channel and leave me your thoughts, because I'd love to hear them. So first of all, how is it possible that great mods and their modders are able to innovate in Medieval 2 even to this day? I think we can thank the engine for that, which allows for not only map changes, but also the introduction of scripts and events that can reshape entire playthroughs and factions. And things like this is a major reason why this historical immersion project is so amazing, because it allows the modders to completely change what it means to play Medieval 2. The mod begins a tad later than the original game, around 11.30 to be precise, and allows for a massive range of factions to be played. Now it must be remembered that Medieval 2 has a hard-coded faction cap of 31, which sadly is a limit any mod for this game will come across. This means that modders have to make a choice on which factions to include, i.e. which faction might be the most important ones for the time period in question. And so, even though a faction like France was more of a ruling hegemon than a centralized kingdom in this period, France remains the only French faction in France. You will for example see that in contrast to Crusader Kings, where the game concept itself is that every kingdom is inherently just a ruling faction in a conglomerate of sub-factions, as is much more historical, this mod tries to simulate that by having relatively unique rebel settlements. Rebels are for example not called rebels, but independent fiefdoms, have their own cultural ties, and can even have events occurring related to them, like when Toulouse hardens its religious stance. It's a shame that this limit still exists and that you can't even negotiate properly with rebels of course, but at least a few steps have been taken to make it seem a tad more realistic. Other than the lack of factions dictated by the engine's limits, Historical Immersion Project goes to amazing lengths to make this as realistic a medieval experience as possible, starting of course with geography. Whereas Medieval 2's original campaign takes a whole lot of liberties with factions and where they are located, HIP does the opposite, making Iberia for example as busy as ever with four different factions, Portugal, Castile, Aragon and the mighty Almoravids in the south. In the north, France keeps control of just half of France, England is seemingly the greater power, while the Holy Roman Empire is a massive juggernaut. And in the east, the Byzantine Empire controls the gate to the east, but beyond them lies a slew of factions. The Kingdom of Jerusalem is an island of Christendom in a sea of Islam, with the Seljuks of Rome, the Ayyubids, the Abbasids, and even more mighty factions surrounding it. The fact that we have smaller and much larger and more powerful factions have important implications for the experience here, namely that some factions are much harder to play than others. Now this might seem self-evident, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Much of Medieval 2 was designed to establish a certain balance between the kingdoms, so you actually had very few factions that were truly small or truly large from the get-go. Here though, size isn't the only thing that matters. Taking Jerusalem as an example, it begins as a fairly weak but compact realm. At this stage, it has no hope whatsoever of actually going on the offensive against its Muslim neighbors, as they are vastly superior at the start. But what Jerusalem has are a few large cities, a powerful fortress, and units that are essentially trained to be on the defensive behind castle gates and walls. Of course, as a Catholic faction, Jerusalem can also make use of crusades if the Pope allows for it, which can massively even the odds by providing you with no upkeep troops and the instant recruitment of crusader type units. We'll go more into the balance and equity of these systems later, but I assure you, somehow, HIP manages to make virtually every faction feel powerful and weak at the same time, which adds so much fun and complexity to the experience, and we'll go over this more in depth right now. First of all, let's talk about the most important aspects first. The economy, stupid. The economy has been completely revamped in HIP, which means that if you play as you normally would in Medieval 2, you're gonna have a bad time real quick. Thing is, this historical immersion project has as its aim to be historical and authentic. The DOI. This impacts the economy in a number of ways, and perhaps the most crucial aspect is that of the new recruitment system. You see, soldiers were a luxury resource in the Middle Ages, and armies weren't really professionalized and standardized at all. In medieval two terms, this has a few implications. Units now often take longer to recruit, with many of the militia or stronger regular units taking at least two to three turns to recruit. And second, once recruited, they take a lot longer to return to the pool. You can access certain units from the barracks and stales in your cities and castles, but if you want the more powerful units, you have to decide which laws your cities should live under. 
For example, each city lives under a law, a special building, which grants various modifiers to that city. For example, you can grant a city to local landowners and feudal lords. This will stabilize the city somewhat, but most importantly, the feudal system brings with it powerful knights. These knights will be the heart of your army for decades. But here's the caveat. While they are only relatively expensive to recruit, but importantly, they replenish fully only about 18 turns or so, and their upkeep costs are astronomic. More than anything, this means that you can't really have massive standing armies. You must think carefully about when you recruit these knights and when you use them, because it's actually vitally important that you do. If not, they're just standing around and wasting your money. Of course, if you need to stand around for active defensive measures, that's one thing. But because of the high upkeep costs, you should ideally have a goal in mind. And because of the long repool times, you better make sure to take good care of them. In my game as France, for example, I had to balance three separate wars against England, Aragon, and the Holy Roman Empire. My cities barely had garrisons, so I constantly rotated them around, making sure generals and their retinues moved to the towns that might find themselves under siege. And then, perhaps you'll manage to get the upper hand after a while, finally being able to go on the offensive with one, that's right, one decently equipped army. And that's exactly why this mod is so brilliant. In the early game especially, you have to do everything you can to maintain what you have, to build it up over time, and not think that you can afford maintaining an army simply because you can raise one. Whereas France must deal with regular unit types, Jerusalem, arguably situated in a lot more danger, have access to the unique Knights of Jerusalem, and crucially, a much easier time getting to and recruiting Holy Order Knights like Templars and Hospitallers. The time to replenish the troops remain high though, so one does well to keep being mindful of this. But the fact that these options are here makes Jerusalem something of a tank faction, one that might move slowly, but is not so easily rattled if you make the right choices. This design choice of having units be a rare and expensive commodity makes every campaign so much more fun, because it makes it feel like your choices actually matter, and that they matter instantly. You actually can't get away with unit spam because you literally can't spam them. And because you can't afford to lose them, you also take more care when deciding how to utilize them. The choice to retrain older units can also be more complicated now, because retraining means it takes longer to recruit completely fresh units. But of course, your diminished unit might have a lot more experience from the field. I really can't overstate how much this changes the game and how great it is, so I guess you'll just have to try it for yourself. It makes regular stainless steel feel like baby cakes is what I'm trying to say here. What also has an impact on recruitment is how the rest of the campaign works, but it's so much bigger than that. Historical Immersion Project's campaign is massive, not only in terms of turns and map scope, but in terms of what it aims to do. This is a campaign with so many new events, triggers, and mechanics working in the background that it might take you some time to learn them. But that only adds to the fun when it comes to an old game you know in and out already. In essence, on select turns, you're shown either events that occurred during the appropriate year or options that need decisions. And often, the historical events actually have an impact on the actual game. Whether it comes to sending financial aid to Jerusalem in the Holy Land, or the prevalence of crossbows becoming a new innovation, or indeed the use of paper mills, or the rising power and influence of the nice hospitalers, these events are so well written and add so much immersion to the experience that it really feels like something close to a medieval 3, a next-gen historical medieval experience. Another way the mod attempts to create this is to offer a range of new buildings. There's a whole slew of new things to build, but a new system of modifiers makes you think before you do so. Some now come with several positive and negative modifiers that you need to take into consideration. So if you need money down the line, but struggle with public order, building that marketplace might not be the best choice after all. At least not right now. And if you do want total control and to convert that local population, perhaps giving them autonomy might be better for you, at least in the short term. Events and the changing times will also open up new building opportunities. And in this way, not only does HIP make you choose wisely, but it also hands you new opportunities depending on the era you're in and the faction you're playing as. There are unique buildings here, like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem and the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. But there's also the Grand Mosque in Damascus, which, and this is really cool, scales added happiness with the amount of local Muslim population. Meaning if you choose to keep the province Muslim, the building works its magic even better. At the same time, new unique buildings will emerge at their historical time of arrival. For example, at one point, you'll be able to gradually construct the Notre Dame of Paris, a process which occurs over several buildings and many, many years. 
These systems bring so much personality to the cities of HIV that it makes a true and honest difference. And again, immersion is at the center stage of what this mod aims to do, but it doesn't end with the buildings, of course. In Stainless Steel Historical Immersion Project, diplomacy is as important as every other aspect. Diplomacy has been overhauled in a major way, and even though it ultimately leads to a much better experience, it can be tough to deal with and feel a bit arbitrary at times. First of all, every military action you make now comes with a relatively major consequence. An attack on an enemy army or settlement will lower your reputation, meaning that for both a short and long war, you can end up becoming fairly tarnished. As a result, the AI is much less likely to deal with you, or can indeed view you as a liability and a possible enemy. See it as a very aggressive, aggressive expansion mechanic, and I say this because it's true. The Medieval 2 engine has a very limited or archaic way to measure these things. So when the mod tries to make it tougher on the player, it works in that it definitely is tougher, but it also ends up making the experience seem a bit unfair. Attacking a rebel settlement is from my point of view a very non-threatening thing to do, but in this mod, it can definitely hurt your reputation, especially if you choose to sack or exterminate the city. It also bugs me that even though when finding myself in a defensive war, defending myself by attacking my new enemy also lowered my reputation, even though I was not the aggressor. And because the Medieval 2 AI is so limited, these systems sadly do not apply to them. It makes sense, of course. And honestly, I'd rather have the system be this way, I think, because it really does make you think a lot more about your actions and whether you can afford to conquer that enemy settlement at all in terms of diplomacy. For you see, the enemy can be willing to negotiate a peace treaty with you, but it really depends on your relations and your reputation. A relationship below very poor will make it almost impossible to conduct diplomacy or peace, and a reputation below mixed can also be hard to manage. However, by not actively waging war, as in staying in your own territory and fighting just defensive battles where you ransom and release your enemy, will over time improve your reputation and relations. In this way, it's possible to gradually move towards peace should you want it. That's what I managed to accomplish as France. I was fighting on three fronts, all defensive wars, but I managed to defend myself over the course of a few decades. In the end, at least one of them, the most powerful one, came to me with an offer of peace, which actually ended in a marriage and alliance between our two kingdoms. It was a fantastic way to end the war, and even though the reputation system therefore can be a tad unreliable and unfair, and despite the AI doing a few weird things which I guess the AI will do in Medieval 2, it at least makes you think a lot more about your actions. And sometimes, the AI can even be quite pragmatic about this. One of the most important aspects of HIP are your characters, and just like with everything else in this mod, they are more important and more awesome than ever. They are crucial to properly govern your provinces, are massively important in battles, everything they are capable of is affected by what they actually have been doing, and in turn affects the world around them, for better or worse of course. Indeed, they are so crucial that, at the very beginning, you can actually choose if you want generals to be required to attack the enemy, meaning, while you can still move armies around in defensive ways and use them like you've always been able to in Medieval 2, you can only offensively attack an enemy army, or indeed, sally forth from a defensive siege with a general leading it. I like enabling this feature as an extra limit on my abilities, and it makes it so much more fun because generals become that much more of a valuable commodity. Your characters do not only become governors, princes, and dukes of cities and castles they find themselves in, but they also get traits and ancillaries based on how long they're there, depending on the buildings present in the city and on their own personality. You see, every family member who makes it to their teens and therefore into the campaign can either be administratively or militarily inclined meaning they will improve these respective skills a lot faster and a lot better if they are stationed in the right place, either a city or a castle. Second, they may begin with certain other traits as well, depending on their fathers, making them either more or less inclined to learning and becoming great themselves. Keeping them in their cities of learning until they are adults is the smartest, especially if you have a school or even a university present, which allows them to become either fully-fledged governors or generals in their own right. But I think a very cool and easy feature to spot in regards to this is that you can actually feel the results of fighting battles multiple times with a family member. Winning particularly tough battles will not only lend them command stars, but the game even tracks certain milestones, like the number of battles a general has fought. And if you accomplish something great, like a major victory or the conquest of a town or heavens forbid, the destruction of a faction, you might even get especially awesome traits. There are just so many modifiers and actions that influences what your characters become now, like the Duke of Poitiers, who became really good at farming and managed to take this once lowly fort town to a bustling castle-ready, well, castle. 
governors are often crucial in tempering the minds of newly conquered cities as well, and can, even in the early game, have major and significant effects not only on the well-being of your army, but on the economy and public order of your settlements. This takes us to one of the most important mid-game goals you'll ever come across, namely the crowning of your faction leader. You see, HIP begins with a ton of kings and emperors and caliphs, but in order for them to actually get that crown and salary, you have to do a whole bunch of stuff. In fact, you have to not only hold all de jure territories of your kingdom, but you need to do things like be stationed in your capital region, have a bunch of money to pay for the ceremony, and be in a place with a grand religious building. There are exceptions to these rules, such as your father already having had the crown, or being in one of the holy cities while having the other modifiers already cleared. But this is likely something that'll take you a good while to accomplish, something I'd personally assume you won't really see until you've played between 100 and 200 turns, perhaps even more, or of course less if you're being extremely aggressive about it. Thing is, this is kind of urgent. As long as your king is uncrowned, generals are likely to become quite disloyal, especially if they find themselves stationed or campaigning a few regions away from the capital. Public order is also likely to be lower, especially on monarch death. All of these modifiers enable de facto civil wars, where rebels overturn the control of entire cities or where disloyal generals turn their backs on you. Plus, faction leaders are required to be in or near the capital to actually hold court and stay in control. But if you choose to move them far away, for example on a crusade, you're kind of enabling a sort of regency. This gives de facto power to hopefully loyal generals, but it all goes to show how many systems there are in place here, and how much effort has gone into creating an experience that caters to not just historical accuracy, but to roleplay and immersion. If there are two things I'll have to convey about the battles of Stainless Steel Historical Immersion Project, it has to be that they both look and play amazingly. Because of the effort put into enhancing and expanding the unit roster from earlier stainless steel versions, the armies of Medieval 2 end up looking so much more varied than before. I love that no matter where or who you're playing as, your units now look authentic, meaning there are no real overarching color schemes for factions anymore in the same way, but a lot more realistic amalgamation of colors, clothing, and armor. Jerusalem, for example, is a lot more varied than before, sporting a range of knights and regular militia. The Celtic Room looks especially fierce, for example, but really, every faction sports so much diversity and personality now. And when considering that there's a bunch of mercenaries here as well, I can almost guarantee you'll never go bored of seeing them duke it out in battle. What makes these battles indirectly even more fun is the economy system on the campaign, since like I mentioned earlier, units are expensive now, which means that fielding feudal knights will matter a lot more than before, and so will making sure they make it out alive. Second is the focus on revamping the battle systems. Units are now given much higher morale and a few more hit points, meaning they generally tend to last a lot longer in battle. I love this because it makes more skirmishes feel like they have substance to them, and because you can't count on the AI to flee quickly, you actually have to make use of tactics to win the day, and if you do so, you'll be able to take a lot of prisoners when everything is said and done, which in this mod is literally worth its weight in gold, especially if you find yourself in possession of an enemy faction leader. Because even though it might be satisfying to press that last button, in this mod, pragmatism is a virtue. And because you're so limited in your armies, especially in the beginning, every battle matters that much more, making each engagement feel like you can seriously set back your enemies or see your own realm in critical danger. This is all to say that Stainless Steel Historical Measure Project is a fantastic piece of modding work that's taken several years to get to where it's at, and it's managed in an unbelievably short time to become one of my favorite Medieval 2 mods, which to be honest, after more than a decade and a half of playing, is quite the achievement. I highly recommend checking out the mod if you crave a fresh and hardcore take on the medieval era, especially if you want to see how much fun a Total War game can actually be when the passion, the depth, and the attention to historical detail is present. Let me know your thoughts on the Stainless Steel Historical Immersion Project in the comments, and tell me if you played it, or if I convinced you to check it out. As always, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers!